heard anything about. This time on Gamers Week Podcast. I never was able to get to the end of that game, and I would absolutely love to find an arcade cabinet of Terminator 2 Judgment Day that I could bring in my home. And then make the kids in your neighborhood play it and then have it pay for itself in like a week. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good to me. You got a quarter? No. What's a quarter? I got a debit card. I'll I'll take that. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely (laughs) swipe it. Does this cabinet take NFTs? (laughs) Get out of my house, kid. All right, guys, you ready to uh, kick this thing off? Let's do it. Background music creeps in. Do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to the Gamers Week podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, worst, and weirdest headlines of the past week in the video game industry. This is episode five. Today is Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. I said that right. Yes, nailed it. <laughs> I don't need your attitude. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ryan, a.k.a. Ruan, a.k.a. Rye Bread. <laughs> and I have with me two excellent people who I'm really excited to introduce. I've got Blue, a.k.a. Blur, and <laughs> the, the one and only Donnie G Retro. How are you guys doing today? We didn't decide on a... Okay, these nicknames that he's referring to were drunk typed by Donnie the other night. (laughs) (laughs) So they're typos that have now become canon, but the problem was we didn't come up with one for Donnie. Just had to wait for one of the other of us to get drunk and start texting. (laughs) (laughs) It has to happen organically. He wanted to come from the heart. I guess that's touching. And uh, for this week, I'd like to be known as the Donnie G, the one and only um, under the weather Donnie G retro. Well, we hope that you feel better, and we appreciate you being a trooper here and coming in and podcasting with us today. I wouldn't miss it. Which brings me to my another excellent surprise we have for today's episode. We have a guest. (gasps) Without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce Trevor from the New Dad Gaming Podcast, one of my favorite podcasts of all time. Trevor, how are you doing today? Doing very good. And it's an interesting requirement to be on this podcast. So it seems I have to drink and text you my drunk uh, <laughs> username I'm going to be called. We're fine with that as well, by the way. <laughs> some, some slur on Trevier or and it just keeps on going, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple R's, Trevor. <laughs> or how, I, how my son pronounced it, Tweva. Nice, nice. <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> Wonderful to be here, guys. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Excellent. And by the way, uh, we are big fans of the new game, do dad gaming podcast. We've been listening to it. Uh, me personally for a while. So you don't have to be a dad to enjoy it. It's outstanding. Trevor and Jeff get a chance to discuss not only games that they like, but things that have kind of happened during the week. So uh, definitely check them out. All right. So why don't we go ahead and jump in today's episode. But before we do, Today's episode is proudly sponsored by the Retro Game Club podcast, another podcast we love, Uh, but we'll tell you more (laughs) about that in a bit. Big fan, lots of podcasts. We like listening to podcasts. We like helping out other podcasts. Podcasting is a cooperative. At least we think it should be. (laughs) Uh, But before we get into the main show, our first order of business is we'd like to point out that the Buffalo Bills play the Kansas City Chiefs this Sunday in the divisional round of the NFL playoffs. Now, we are by no means a sports ball podcast, so you're probably wondering why we bring it up. (laughs) Sports ball. Well, this game may be of interest to our listeners because Ryan is a Bills fan and Donnie is a Chiefs fan. Go Chiefs. (laughs) (laughs) Therefore, I have decided a small bet is in order. Whomever's team loses this weekend will be singing I'm a Little Teapot in the next episode. So please tune in and look forward to that. Oh, I, I apologize for our listeners' ears. <laughs> Do you know the word? <laughs> please tell me there's a live stream where the actions to the song 
will also be performed. <laughs> uh, that might end up on our Twitter. <laughs> I, I would love to see that. And not only that, but uh, we each have to wear, or the person that loses has to wear one of those big little boat peep frilly dresses with the oh. blonde wig and the curls. <laughs> I, I don't own one of those, but you're going to lose. Sure so I don't. would suggest that you would go out and buy one. I'll goodwill that stuff all day long. <laughs> Stakes keep getting higher. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So why don't we go ahead and jump into our review segment for the day? So, Donnie, do you mind taking this one? Sure. Today, we're debuting a new segment called Reviews, Reactions, and Requests, the three R's. This is where we'll be sharing the feedback that we get on the show. At Michael Lundin sent in a comment regarding the cross-platform ban program discussion in episode four. If I were to identify a person to ban across services, I would use payment details for identification. Most of these online play services require payment detail. It's possible to get around, but painful. At Emo-esque underscore IWL says, how about a nice little jingle or buzzer between topics? Also, I would personally like a quick little three to five minute section on any notable releases for the week of the podcast or the next week and the team's opinions on those titles. At Day and Nightly says, getting a chance to listen to you guys and just reach the non-discussion of Splatfest from the first episode. (laughs) Audio gold and really enjoying it. Well, thank you for the feedback, everyone. (laughs) The first topic, when he says about the... um, the payment details, you know, it, it, and he, he, he does state that it, it's painful to get around it. I mean, I, the only thing that I can think of is canceling whatever debit card, credit card that you have that you sure. use to make that payment and obviously getting another one. It's a little bit easier to do, I guess, if it's a, if it's a bank card. I don't know mm-hmm. how easy it is um, for like a credit card. Point being is that, of course, it would take you a couple. I mean, it wouldn't be something you'd be able to do instantly. So it, right. would, it would take some time. Yeah. In order to get around it, and obviously, you're going to start raising some red flags at the bank when you're asking <laughs> for a new credit right. card number. Right, and there's probably only so many times you can do it before they shut you down. So, right, and great deterrent. You'd be like, "Are you involved in criminal activities by hand?" <laughs> <laughs> no, just flame warring on Call of Duty. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do like too because they'd have to. You can imagine how much stuff is tied to that card. So. I decide to lose my head oh, yeah. in Call of Duty or something. All of a sudden, I have to change Netflix, Disney, my cable yeah. bill, like everything that tied to the card. So that, that's right. a pretty nice little punishment that you'd have to get through. Hopefully, you learn your lesson. And then um, the jingle or buzzer between topics. We'll try it out this episode. Everybody let us know what you think. And then uh, we'll also include a little section about notable releases. And again, uh, if you guys like it, want it to continue, let us know what you think. I wonder what kind of jingle you're going to use. I have yet to decide. I will decide when I start editing. Let's all go to the next part. Let's all go to the <laughs> next part. Wait wait one week. Can you grab a nice little clip from I'm a Little Teapot? <laughs> there you go. an infamy. It'd be great. <laughs> oh, I really like that idea. Oh, my gosh. No, you do not. Yes, Ryan. Yes, Trevor Brian. needs to be on the show every week. <laughs> yeah, I look at kicked off of the show. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what do you care, Ruan? You said you were going to win anyway. It's true. He's scared. This is true, but I just don't want to have to hear Donnie singing that <laughs> every week. <laughs> nice cover. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And now it's time for the... Very important poll. <laughs> <laughs> Every Monday on Twitter, we post our VIP, a.k.a. Very Important Poll. And if you'd like to participate, you can follow us on Twitter at GamersWeekPC. So the question of the week was, what is your favorite arcade light gun game? So our choices were Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which got 16.7% of the vote. House of the Dead, which got 32.6% of the vote. And the winner for this week was Time Crisis. Uh, Just squeaked this one out with 37 0.7% of the vote and 13.1% of folks voted other. So let's look at some answers from the other category. Roadrunner Moose said Carn Evil easily. I even own the light gun itself, which actually he posted a picture of. So can confirm he does actually own the light gun itself. (laughs) Uh, Andy Warnock 06. I remember being blown away the first time I saw Mad Dog McCree in the arcade. I agree. I play game 64. That's a tough one. Went with Time Crisis, but love light gun games. Vampire Knight and Silent Scope on the PS2 were are awesome. And a point blank was on the poll that would win with ease. Super Famicom. I love the spell. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, Virtual Cop on the Sega Chihiro. The game looked super impressive at the time. The bullet time effects in the air were amazing. Such a shame the franchise died. And lastly, Fern Lee Flynn says, let's go jungle in the fun co-op with a friend. Admittedly, I played it at a bachelorette party and had a few drinks in me, which may have added to the experience. Very nice, Fern. <laughs> All right, so taking a look at our options here, why don't we go ahead and start with Blue. What did you pick? What was your favorite light gun arcade game? Man, this was a tough choice. Really mm-hmm. love House of the Dead. Really love Time Crisis. Mm-hmm. Really love the uh, Jurassic Park arcade. We've talked about that before. But the one that I had to go with was Area 51. Excellent ah, choice. Excellent. Very good. Yes, it's, it's older, I believe, than the other ones on this list. But the thing that kind of pushes it over the top is how ubiquitous it was. Right. It's like in every pizza parlor, it's in every laundromat, it was in, you know, grocery stores, it was everywhere because it was a much smaller cabinet. So it was it was easier to place in places and that meant that I could play a lot of Area 51. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I loved about that game too is that every time you picked up and played it, even though it was the same game, it's still caught you by surprise there were elements to it that you know with constant movement on there and then there was a difference if you were playing with one player versus two like there, mm-hmm. there was a lot of variety in the game itself even though it's it's an uh, on-rail shooter <laughs> you know so and that's what a lot of the uh the, the good light gun games have is that they it, they keep you distracted just enough to where right. your, your eyes are going down into this part of the screen and next thing you know on the left side something's jumping out at you you're supposed to shoot it while you're dead another quarter please <laughs> <laughs> it made watching it a lot of fun because you got to see all the extra details you miss right. When, right. You're, when you're in the heat of the moment. Yes, so. exactly. Great arcade fodder for sure. And then some of the uh, upgrades and stuff too, when you would all of a sudden get a, uh, like a rapid fire gun, like a machine uh-huh. gun. Look at this, I'm so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. Right. <laughs> you want to play rough? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Donnie, what did you pick? <laughs> It was hard. It, it was a very tough choice. Area 51 is definitely a good one, like Blue said. Um, there are tons of shooters out there like House of the Dead, Time Crisis, Virtua Cop. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, a, that's an old but goodie. What I picked, and I actually had a tough, to, uh, a tough choice between two of them, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. That yeah. was my pick. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a big honking machine with like double screens. <laughs> yep. Um, and, you know, the Uzis that you go up there and you could feel the rumbling in the Uzis and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And, and we've had other people um, on the poll that say like, oh, I dumped so much money in there. I ended up beating it. I never could. Yeah. I never was able to get to the end of that game. And I would absolutely love to find an arcade cabinet of Terminator 2 Judgment Day that I could bring in my home. And then make the kids in your neighborhood play it and then have it pay for itself in like a week. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. You got a quarter? No. What's a quarter? I got a debit card. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll definitely t- <laughs> Just swipe it. Does this cabinet take NFTs? <laughs> get out of my house kid. <laughs> the second game i had was um i'm not sure how popular this game was i know it was popular for me back in the 90s but it was a game called revolution x with aerosmith <laughs> yes. oh my gosh aerosmith <laughs> i know yes. what you're talking yes. about yes Aerosmith, they had their own shooter, rail shooter game (laughs) where they were abducted by, uh, I can't remember what the bad people group or the bad guys. It's not important. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) That is not the the entertainment value here. (laughs) Didn't the lead singer come and like chide you if you lost to come and tell you off like, come on, you got another game in you. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Don't stop now. Yeah! That was, that was great. Uh, <laughs> Make that our swear sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, calling it a rail shooter, it's such a token of the time because it certainly felt like there were some rails going on to have approved that concept. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, Aerosmith, you're all about gun action and arcade games. Let's get you in a wow. game. Whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> Is there going to be drugs in there too? No, we can't have I'm that. I'm pretty sure that drugs were involved in the process of approving the game. So, <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Trevor, uh, what did you go with? 
So I had, yeah, I agree with all the sediment here. Won't go over it. I think uh, if I had to choose one of the three, I went with other. But if I had to choose one of the three, time crisis with the pedal mm -hmm. for ducking yeah. and reloading. Yep. Felt so immersive compared to some of the other shooters I thought. And obviously the gun rattling, it was awesome. Definitely. The one I actually chose, uh, it was like a cartoon driving shooting one called Lucky and Wild. <laughs> yes. Like dumb cartoons and there was a rear view mirror. We could see your characters making silly expressions and you were driving with Uzis and shooting other cars <laughs> with, you know, no concern given for passerbys or anything else. And, you know, the pro tip was that you chose one person, you did a co-op, one person drove, focused on driving to avoid things, and the other person got the double Uzis. <laughs> and that would just that would make the game go so much easier. You're supposed to, one guy's supposed to drive and shoot, but that was the pro tip to get through it. If you see some replays of it on uh, YouTube, it is a wild title. But uh, that, that one, for some reason, held a place in my heart. So that's that would be my vote under other. That sounds amazing. So the real question is, which one were you? The driver or the double wielding Uzis? I think I was always the driver. Calm and cool under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I don't want to get my hands dirty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Only an accessory to murder. <laughs> 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 so what was your choice, Ryan? Uh, so this is a game that I have loved for a very long time. Carnival is one mm. that I've played for years and I still love it. I've beaten it a few times and... Still keeps me coming back. It's really, there's really a lot of good humor in it uh, mixed with the the horror elements. And it's just, it's really done well. Uh, and as far as a shooting game is concerned, it's, you know, similar to, to kind of the, the rest of the games we've been talking about. It's on rails. You're at like an evil carnival. There, <laughs> There's like goblins and ghosts and ghouls and all these things in which you're uh, trying to to kill with your pump action shotgun which is great the, the little pump action that you get from it is like just mm -hmm. this tactile field behind it but it even includes lines like have some fun eat your heart out with a sesame seed bun <laughs> so, <laughs> like that? i said the humor is great <laughs> with it and it's, it's a lot of fun to play and uh yeah it's one of my favorites for sure all right so before we jump into the news for the week why don't we do a quick shout out to our amazing patrons Blue, do you mind taking this one? You wouldn't think a brand new podcast would already have patrons and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay. We got the giggles tonight. I love it. <laughs> this will be fun to cut later. All right. <laughs> you wouldn't think a brand new pay... <laughs> brand new paycast? <laughs> paycast. <laughs> Keep all of this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You wouldn't think a brand new podcast would already have patrons, and frankly, no one is more surprised than we are. Here are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon. Davey PGH, the Red Ox PDX family, including Shannon and Luke, Zach Huge Thanks, Random Retro Dude, Michael Lundin, Princess Kitty Mew Mew, Mega Retro Man, Emo Esque, Rye Bread's number one fan, Fruitcake's number one stan, The Wizard of Zardoz, Clayman 71, Great Sayaman 81, BNT Zilla Guy, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Freight Grande, Producer BTW, Ducks in Disguise, and Games with Coffee. <gasps> You made it. You did, I did it. it. <laughs> if you like what you hear today, and we really hope you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as other cool stuff we'll be doing like prizes and giveaways. Visit patreon.com slash gamersweek or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. Excellent. So why don't we go ahead and jump into our high headlines for the day. Donnie, do you want to read our, uh, our little disclaimer first? No. <laughs> it has to be done we have to address it <laughs> no i was i was reading it i said no and there was a long pause in between oh, so okay, okay. Yeah, let me yeah, finish yeah. Mm -hmm. no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> no we won't be talking about final fantasy in the italian senate even though it certainly is a weird story this is a pg rated show and we're sure that those of you who listen with your kids will appreciate not having to explain it to them You'll have to Google it yourself. <laughs> As one such person with kids, I thank you for it. You're, right. <laughs> you're welcome. And for the adults listening, definitely Google it. <laughs> definitely. But not while you're at work. <laughs> right. Not <while> right. <laughs> you're not Google it at work. I'm Googling it right now. <laughs> Lost them for a minute, at least. There you go. <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first up from VGC, Trevor, do you mind taking this one? Absolutely. From VGC, Xbox boss expects PlayStation's inevitable Game Pass rival to include new games on day one. Details on an Xbox Game Pass competitor service reportedly being planned by PlayStation emerged in December and picked up steam last week. According to documents seen by Bloomberg, the new service is codenamed Spartacus and will combine the current PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now services, phasing out the branding of the latter. It's expected to launch for PS4 and PS5 this spring and to be structured across three payment tiers. The first will reportedly include existing PlayStation Plus benefits such as online play and free monthly titles. The second will offer a large catalog of games like Xbox Game Pass, although not first-party titles at launch. The third will add extended demos, game streaming, and a library of classics PlayStation games. Asked about the claims by IGN, Xbox boss Phil Spencer said he believes a Game Pass-like service from Sony is inevitable. I don't mean it to sound like we've got it all figured out, he said, but I think the right answer is allowing your customers to play the games they want to play, where they want to play them, and giving them choice about how they build their library. (laughs) So before we get into this discussion, I need to ask, so the headline of this, Xbox boss expects PlayStation. <laughs> like, is this something that all the gaming journals have agreed upon? Is that particular phrase, Xbox boss? And then expects. They throw in an extra X just to toss it in. Xbox boss expects. Uh, <laughs> Xbox boss expectantly expects. <laughs> it's like they know what kind of show we run and then they're just trolling us. It sounds like vocal warm-ups, you know, like Xbox boss expects. Xbox boss expects. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I would just like to say that Trevor pronounced it perfectly Two times. Oh, I was so worried. Xbox I, boss. I was, I, my uh, my tongue was just terrified <laughs> reading it. My, my eyes were going. My brain was going. My tongue was just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, my hat's off to you, Trevor, because I could not do it last week. <laughs> I, I'm excited about the potential of a PlayStation mm-hmm. streaming service like the Game Pass because I am an unembedded fan of the Game Pass. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mentioned a lot on the show and especially from a family perspective, just a wealth of games being able to download any of them to the kids delight, try it. Hey, turns out the kid doesn't like it. I didn't lose 80 bucks in the process. Right. And the thought that PlayStation's getting into the game as well, really exciting. And I think that it's interesting that this is where the industry is going. I'm not complaining. I think it's great. Uh, but years ago, this would would have been a, uh, an afterthought. Nobody would want to do this because there was so much more money mm-hmm. in purchasing physical games and having that collection and everything like that. That was the business model. And now it has shifted so much into uh, basically cloud-based gaming. You know, this seems to be what we can expect out of these companies moving forward. And eventually, anyway, and we talked about this too before, the idea that Xbox and PlayStation will eventually just be something you plug into your, your TV to access this mm-hmm. stuff. Dongle. Um, right, the dongle, <laughs> if you will. Dongle. <laughs> but uh, in the overall, in the end of the day, if it makes ex- gaming more accessible to to you and, and your friends, then by all means, I think it's great. Does it really? I mean, if you think about how much money it's going to cost to mm. access that content, and not to mention the fact that I know that broadband is widely widely available for most of the homes, especially in the United mm-hmm. States, but not everybody has it. Not everybody has access to that. So if I mm-hmm. still wanted to play my uh, – and I looked away. <laughs> if I still wanted to play my, my PlayStation, <laughs> my N64, my NES. Um, you know, I could still do that as a physical medium collector, but uh, – you're right. It it does create the ease of being able to just plug mm-hmm. in a system, download that game and play it. Um, but then you're talking about a, a continuous price gouge for, and I, I guess I use the term price gouge. I, I sh- probably shouldn't use that one, but they're going to continue to get money from us for something that yep. we uh, should have been paid off a long time ago. It's like, it's like a, a student loan that you're never going to get out from underneath. Right. Oh, that hurts. That's too close to home for me. <laughs> me too. And, uh, you know, you have a really good point, though. I I have the PlayStation now. And I overall, I really like it. It's a great way to try out games, like Trevor was saying, with no monetary risk. Mm-hmm. The thing that I don't like about it is that it seems like most of the titles are not available for download for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. They only have some that can be downloaded to play on your console. And others have to be streamed. And if you're hmm. streaming it from their service, you can't take screenshots, you can't record video. And like you were mm. saying, Donnie, if your broadband sucks, 
you know, you might have trouble, which I know definitely where I live, the little tiny town where I live, the internet's, it's pretty good, but (laughs) I wouldn't bet my life on it. It's okay. (laughs) It's not bad. And you bring up an interesting point because I think that one of the, the other aspects to this is that because physical media is available to you, obviously this whole service doesn't have an effect on you. But eventually, if that's the way the industry goes, where it's just only downloadable content or cloud-based gaming, you may find that people don't end up adopting that kind of or that future uh, in regards to accessibility for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, it's certainly concerning because the thought that they... It, its success would herald the death of physical media mm-hmm. is certainly worrying for many reasons. A, just ownership. B, accessibility for like the downloads that you mentioned as well. So as I, I will say like to kind of taper my previous point, as excited as I am for these streaming services, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's certainly something we need to be wary of, I think, and, and something they need to earn our trust on, that they're good stewards of this idea, that it's not yes. Uh, price g- gouging, like Donnie said, it's not the loss of physical media, like you guys pointed out, that people won't be able to access it. So, mm-hmm. you know, that it, exciting days, but can, we need to <laughs> certainly walk carefully forward to make sure we're not leaving anyone behind and ruining this pastime. Right. I agree. From comicbook.com, new Donkey Kong game for Nintendo Switch rumored to be in development. Mentioned in a recent podcast from Nate the Hate, who has previously had scoops associated with upcoming video games, a new Donkey Kong title was mentioned to be in the works at Nintendo. However, outside of this simple confirmation that Nintendo is developing said game, Nate didn't have much more knowledge on the subject. He stated that he's... <laughs> that just seems... God. Some guy's like, hey, I think they're developing this. Oh, yeah? Well, can you tell us more? <laughs> nope, I don't have anything else. <laughs> I've checked my crystal ball. <laughs> End of statement. (laughs) Don't quote me. He stated that he's not sure if it's meant to be a 2D title or a 3D title, and also went on to say that he's still uncertain about the possibility of it being revealed and released this year. The one important piece of conjecture that he did add, however, tied back in Super Nintendo World, which is Nintendo's theme park at Universal Studios in Japan. At this time, a new Donkey Kong section of the park is being built and is set to open in the future. Nate hypothesized that this new Donkey Kong game for Nintendo Switch could somehow be associated with the theme park that Nintendo is currently creating. While it's uncertain how these two projects might intertwine with one another, this could be the reason why Nintendo has yet to announce this new Donkey Kong game just yet. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it does sound like a very non-newsy story coming out of comicbook.com. The only reason I think that we bring it up here is that, I mean, it seems legit. It's been a long time since Tropical Freeze. It should, it feels like it should be about time. And then the other thing is that Hmm. Nate the Hate whatever his inside scoop is, he's been right before many times in the past. Mm. I don't know if he's got the uncle at Nintendo <laughs> or what, <laughs> but he does seem to know. Yeah. Tropical freeze was 2014. Wow. wow. So it's, it's been a spell. Yeah. So let, me, let me give you guys a pitch. So Donkey Kong world, the physical space, the actual amusement park, mm-hmm. kids are running up uh, certain sections like platforms, things like that. Uh, online players in the game get to throw barrels at the kids <laughs> to knock hey. them off. Real barrels? <laughs> Real barrels, yeah. <laughs> this is like an episode of Wipeout. Then. <laughs> exactly. Oh, dude. Exactly. I love that idea. That is the best thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And I want to be a kid dodging barrels. No, I want to throw the barrels. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you're a sadist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nintendo's foray into augmented reality is just chuck, chucking barrels at their kids. <laughs> That's <laughs> not a great. bad idea. Like you could, they could be on steel girders and no safety harnesses, nothing like that, and they just drop <laughs> hey, down. And, sorry, it's it's a it's a play at your own risk. You signed the waiver before you came in. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> in all seriousness, do you have any ideas what you would want out of a new Donkey Kong game? Not 3D. Can, what I would worry about is they do a 3D open world right. type of thing. Perhaps they can do it well, but it would feel like to stay true to Donkey Kong would be keep it 2D, just do a really great title like uh, Tropical Freeze was. Now, what do you guys think? I don't know. They're doing it with Kirby. Oh, true. That looks pretty good, though. <laughs> <laughs> so they might be able to do it. It might not be so bad. But in general, I will agree with you that I prefer 2D to 3D. Yeah, I was a much bigger fan of Donkey Kong Country than I was on Donkey Kong 64. Even though yeah. DK64 is not a bad game, per se, the the platforming in Donkey Kong Country and even Tropical Freeze is really, really well done. 
Hmm. It, I, I think again, too, one of the, the worries that I run into is that everything has to be 3d nowadays, uh, with Donkey Kong, because of its legacy, uh, it's one of those titles that doesn't have to, in my opinion, have to be 3d in order for it to, to have a home, uh, in, in the, the modern space. So I would, <laughs> uh, bring me another Donkey Kong country and I will be a very, very happy man. Yeah. That's simple. Really? Mm-hmm. We did get a 2d Metroid, so I guess you never know. Oh, that's a good mm, point. Nice. Yeah. Now, I, I kind of foresee something like maybe if if it was something with Donkey Kong in the terms of Tetris 99, where you have multiple people battling it out with like the classic Donkey Kong stages, however modernized, oh, no. I, however, I, 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 I kind of just brainstorm this idea, but however you can. <laughs> it's working. It's though. genius. It's working. <laughs> I, I, would, I would envision something like that and I would like to see something like that. <laughs> I do not want Donkey Kong 99 before we get Dr. Mario 99. That seems really, really unfair to me. 99. Yeah, Donkey Kong 99, that sounds awesome. That could be a good time. No, no. Imagine if it's for mobile, though. Ooh. Oh. You just killed it. Why did I say that? I'm sorry. Why did I say that? Don't you blaspheme in here. <laughs> All right, next up from PC Gamer, Troy Baker faces powerful backflash over AI voice NFT promotion. Are we are we five for five? I think we are. We might be five for five. <laughs> <laughs> make it stop. <laughs> make, make the news not contain NFTs. All right. Prolific voice actor Troy Baker, best known for Bioshock Infinite. Booker DeWitt in The Last of Us is that, that's how I would say that. The Uses. Last of Us is. Say it, The Last of Us is. Okay, Last <laughs> of Us is Joel. The Last of Weez. <laughs> Found himself in hot water with fans after tweeting about a partnership with a voice NFT company. The backlash was spurred not only by Baker's decision to get into the notoriously sketchy NFT game, but in the tone of the message. Baker tweeted, We all have a story to tell. You can hate or you can create. What will it be? <laughs> the voice. NFTs Baker is promoting are a little different from the low quality monkey JPEGs we're used to. They're based on audio rather than crappy pictures. <laughs> Whoever wrote this is awesome. <laughs> Not pulling any punches. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Voice Verse NFT account purports to explain what they're all about, although to be honest, I don't know what most of it actually is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> there are some expressions of support scattered here and there in the responses to Baker's tweet, but overall the reaction was po- powerfully negative. The blowback was enough to cause Baker to clarify his reasons for taking up the NFT cause, although gave no indication that he's rethinking his position. I always want to be part of the conversation, even if sometimes that finds me in the midst of a loud one. Baker said in a brief follow-up Twitter thread, the hate slash create part might have been a bit antagonistic. Hope y'all will forgive me for that. (laughs) Pretty much like, it's it's really interesting position we find ourselves in where you seem to have like on one side of you all of these voices saying that NFTs and blockchain and, and crypto and all this kind of stuff like these are the future. You got to get in now. If you're smart, you'll get in now. And then it seems like you have the the other voice you know, as far as these things are targeted to gamers, then you've got the the gaming audience saying, no, this is crap. We don't want it. Stop trying to force it on us. I mean, even the New York Times recently ran a piece that was entitled, Crypto Enthusiasts Meet Their Match, Angry Gamers. (laughs) The gaming world has been so vocal about how much we do not want this stuff in our games that even the New York Times is taking notice. But on the other hand... You have companies like Konami. They decided to celebrate Castlevania's 35th anniversary. Well, they did an auction of NFTs. <laughs> Gross. Now, th- that sounds like a horrible betrayal to Castlevania fans from a company that we really wanted more from. Well, you'd be about right. But Konami ended up making over $162,000. On this yeah. NFT auction, one piece even sold for over $26,000. Wow. So if you put these two factors together, it doesn't matter how much the gamers say, we do not want NFTs in our games. If you only need a couple of people to spend this kind of money, companies mm-hmm. will keep doing it. Hmm. I don't think the collective gamer audience is going to be the ones um, buying NFTs. It's going to be the super rich who can afford it. And this is... NFTs based on audio, 
So does this mean if somebody like, so our podcast, Mm -hmm. can somebody just, I don't know, uh, download the podcast, run it in audacity, take a clip and say, Hey, I own this clip. I'm gonna sell it as an NFT. I mean, how can, Mm -hmm. how can they say, well, no, that's, that's not your voice. That's my voice. How can you tell? Yeah. I bought your voice. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I own your voice. I own you now. How does that work? So here's the explanation of of what this voice NFT company, here's what they said. Voice NFTs provide unlimited perpetual access to the underlying AI voice that the NFT represents ownership of. If you own a voice NFT, you can create all kinds of voice content and you will own all of the IP, the thread states. Imagine being able to create customized audiobooks, YouTube videos, e-learning lectures, or even podcasts with your favorite voice, all without the hassle of additional legal work. This also allows people with limited resources to access professional-grade voices more easily. So this is going to basically eliminate voice talent. All you have to do is just record your voice once, and this AI thing will create something in that person's voice. Is that what I'm getting at? I guess, but why does that need to be an NFT? Why couldn't that just be like a subscription service? Great question. (laughs) Have these people met the internet before? (laughs) Because it's like, what I'm going to, I'm going to buy Troy Baker's voice. And the very first thing I do is, hi, I'm Troy Baker. I'm a complete jackass. (laughs) And that's produce that constantly with the AI, you know, ad nauseum. It's you got to respect a certain energy and new things, new technologies, you know, what could the benefits be like what interesting things could be created. Wonderful. But then something like this, I think you hit the nail on the head. One of the biggest critiques of NFTs I've seen has been, this is currently services that you can buy, but you've just wrapped, you said web three crypto and NFT. And all of a sudden you want it to blow up 10 times in value. So it feels so unfortunately scammy and to see it Mm -hmm. weasel its way into something like the art of voiceover into the art of game making it man does it hurt like it's just <laughs> what i what i look forward to hopefully happening is a year from now when we review the year 2022 we'll be able to look back on the whole nft craze and go hey, hey, hey it wasn't that fun <laughs> <laughs> we were right All right, next up from VGC, PS5 and Xbox Series X scalper claims he's creating young entrepreneurs. Hmm. Try to keep your blood pressure under control. (laughs) (laughs) I heard a slight groan coming from Trevor on that one. No, man. (laughs) All right. Jack Bayless of Aftermarket Arbitrage runs a subscription service where members pay him 30 pounds a month to be informed of new restocks of valuable goods such as the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. With 1,500 subscribers, Bayless is now in a position where he claims to be earning 45,000 pounds a month. And that works out to $61,000 by helping other people buy desirable items in bulk and reselling them at higher prices, often before the rest of the public have a chance to buy them at the original cost. But despite claiming he's, quote, very in tune with his moral compass and conscious that families can't buy consoles because of his business, he told Sky News that he believed the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. To me, Owning the PS5 or an Xbox isn't a necessity. It's a luxury, okay? If you can afford to spend 450 pounds, spending the extra 100 pounds should be pretty marginal. Bayless claimed that many of his subscribers are very young, and he's helping them create their own business. They spend more time with the family, with their kids, he said. We've then had one of our members. He was 20,000 pounds in gambling debt, and we took him on. He's been with us for a year. He's now in the clear, and he's made, I think, he's made a significant amount of money. Can I just uh, say something really quick? If, If you have to, in an interview... Claim that you're very in tune with your moral compass. <laughs> the odds of that being true are, are pretty much zero, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those weird, like, thought experiments that you get in philosophy class. Right, right. <laughs> like, how can you morally justify being a scalper? I, I like the wording. Because right? to be in tune with his moral compass, his moral compass seems to point directly to hell. So, like, yeah. <laughs> of course, of course he didn't say where it was pointing, right? Yeah, he did not say which way he was going. He just said he knew how to read it. Mm-hmm. It sounds like the whole thing. I'm not a racist, but. Oh. <laughs> yeah. As a general rule, if you got to say it, right. it's probably not true. So I will, um, I will play the other side of the coin here. I, I, I agree with Jack, but I also disagree. And I'll tell you why. I agree with him that 
when you're talking about something like PlayStation 5s, Xbox Series Xs, he is right. Those are a luxury. They're not a necessity. So if somebody's complaining that their kid's not getting a PS5 for Christmas because you're buying them all up and selling them at a higher price, well, it's it's not – your kids don't need it. It's a first world problem. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But the, the flip side of that coin is that spending the extra 100 pounds should be pretty marginal. That I don't agree with because what happens to the, the family that is saving up to buy an Xbox or a PS5 – and you know they they have just enough money to buy it at retail or slightly above retail, and these things were going. You could buy an Xbox uh, Series X or a PS5 for four ninety nine, and they were selling for seven hundred and fifty dollars, eight hundred dollars, eight hundred and fifty dollars, thousand dollars, right around Christmas yeah. time. Yes, right. now they have dipped back down to where they're only selling for like maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars over retail because I think they're more widely available. But, uh, you know, I I will argue that he does have a point. It's not a necessity. It is a luxury. Yeah, it's not, at least it's not, you know, masks or, you know, insulin or something to that effect. So we hear him, but just because he's not, just because he's right doesn't mean he's not wrong. Mm. What's, what's, how's that goes? It's by the letter of the law, but not the intent. As much as it is a luxury to rob those moments of joy from a particular segment such as this that is ultimately kind of like a joy machine from what this thing is, like to, to target it specifically and have it ruined by them is you know, unconsciousable. It's, th- th- this entire saga has been sad from beginning to end. And I don't know if there's – what can be done to make it a bit better, but like, darn this guy. <laughs> I, don't know. Just, I uh, mean, there, there's a word for this, profiteering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They are mm-hmm. – Taking advantage of a scarcity, I don't think you can justify it morally, no matter how you try. Yeah, I mean, that's great that you can help some people spend more time with their kids and that you can help somebody else get out of their gambling debt, but sorry, I'm not buying it. (laughs) You're creating an extra obstacle in the chain of supply and demand. Extra obstacle that has no other reason to be there other than just you want to stand in people's way and make them pay to get through you. There, There is no way to justify that. And I really don't care how many people you helped get out of your gambling debt. It's American consumerism. That's, <laughs> <laughs> but that's really well said. Like there's no, it, it's taking value while providing none to right, exactly. anybody. That's, that's a good way of putting it there, Blue. All right, so why don't we jump into our top three new releases for this week? Yep, so the top three new releases. Shadow Man Remastered, that's launching on the Switch. The modernized re-release of the 1999 cult superhero game finds new life on consoles. Nobody Saves the World. Platform, that's on the Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, and PC. An absurd new take from the dungeon-crawling genre by Drinkbox, the developers of the Guacamelee series. And Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Extraction. That's on PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Stadia, and PC. A spin-off 2015's Rainbow Six Siege, Extraction is a cooperative multiplayer tactical shooter in which players must work together to combat and defeat a type of parasite-like aliens called the Arcarians. Arcarians, Arcarians... Take your Archaeans? back. You, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. Cheerios? <laughs> Archeans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> However it goes. Hey, at least it's not a battle royale, right? <laughs> Yet. <laughs> it's coming. Yet. Yeah. 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 Are you guys excited for any of these in particular? I'm interested in Nobody Saves the World. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I could feel, feel your expectations. Dungeon Crawlers, good. Guacamelee series, freaking fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of wish it was on PlayStation and Switch as well, but Switch mm-hmm. things usually get a port if you're patient. <laughs> so I can be patient. Yeah, I, was, I was interested in the Rainbow Six Extraction. Uh, don't like shooters that much, especially tactical when you're actually fighting other humans. What was interesting about this one, it wasn't just, okay, let's add zombies and it's the exact same game. It was, let's take this really tight, this very weighty, this very well-honed shooter series, and as opposed to going against a another team of actual people in a tense standoff, it's now you versus, what, a PVE, I think they call that? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just turning it on its head. So if you want to kind of get into that series and it, uh, the game engine for it is fantastic. looks like a lot of fun. It's kind of an interesting way to dip into it. So it's a nice, I think, uh, extension to that title. Donnie, would you be interested in something like that? I know that you're into shooters. So I, I played Rainbow Six Siege um, very briefly and I, I, I liked it. It was fun, but I'm with Trevor it's like, I don't like to think when I'm shooting. Just let me shoot. <laughs> it's like, I have five. Aim gun, pull trigger. Exactly. No not, not, I don't have time for five <laughs> times two over three divided by four. Multiply that. I'm like, it's like, huh? Just throw the grenade. Yeah, whenever there's a, a pre-game lobby where the X's and O's are going up looking like a football play session, <laughs> you know it's the wrong type of game. Yeah. <laughs> So has anyone played Shadow Man prior to this? Uh, no. I'm nope. completely unaware of this game. So the fact that it's a cult superhero game from 1999 is surprising that I at least... Go look at the, the, the cover art for the previously released N64 and PlayStation 1. I think you'll remember it. Mm-hmm. You might, okay. but uh, it definitely it did not do enough to sell the game to me back in the early days enough to want to play it. What I have liked from the current reviews is it seems like they did this remaster good in so much that, hey, you remember this game? Did you like this game? Well, now it looks better, sounds better, and plays a little better. Enjoy. And then they walked out of the room. Like, like it's not overdone. There's no microtransaction. Perfect. It's just a nice little upgrade. Right. So I, that's encouraging. $59. Uh, that's less encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want to you, you wanna revamp the game, remaster it, sell it to me for 19 bucks. I might check mm-hmm. it out. You know, a more modern version of the game that's not on the horrible N64. Yeah, I said it. Fight me. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we jump into our main topic for today, why don't we uh, talk about our sponsor? Blue. I'm sorry. Donnie. Donnie. Why don't you take this one? Gamers Week Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Retro Game Club Podcast. It's a fantastic family-friendly retro gaming podcast. In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss. Their current games are Soul Calibur and any retro Madden game. Rest in peace. They also have news, Mm. interviews, and other special topics. Visit RetroGameClub.net to check them out or follow the link in the show notes. And by the way, big congratulations to you guys. Sounds like you had a, a fantastic amount of downloads on the most recent episode. So hooray. Good job. Yeah, guys. That, what a way to launch your season four. Congratulations. Who's up? The website, you got to check it out. Like the the way that they break down the discussion on each of the episodes. And it's like, what hardware are they on? What emulation hacks they're doing mm-hmm. games? It's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's something I may need to emulate. It's excellent. Definitely check out the website. All right, so why don't we talk about our main topic for today. So, from The Ringer, and I'm sure you're all expecting this uh, to the surprise of no one. Or the surprise of everyone. That we're covering (laughs) it, not that that we weren't surprised that it happened. The the, the fact that we're covering it is that Microsoft purchase of Activision Blizzard encapsulates an industry in a single deal. So, on January 10th, Phil Spencer, the head of Xbox and executive vice president of gaming at Microsoft, said on the New York Times podcast, Sway that he hadn't come to get into any kind of finger-wagging at other companies specifically. One of Microsoft's prominent partners, the preposterous but benign prosperous. video game conglomerate. What's that? Prosperous, not preposterous. Is it prosperous? Yes. All right, I'm... <laughs> Prosperously preposterous. Oh, <laughs> all right, they're do, they're doing good, but benighted video game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, specifically one of Microsoft's prominent partners, the prosperous... <laughs> But benighted video game conglomerate Activision Blizzard. Spencer declined to engage in what he termed virtue shaming, saying, I would rather help other companies than try to get into punishing. I don't think my job is out there to punish other companies. Spencer won't be able to duck questions about Activision on the basis of it being another company now, because Microsoft and Activision are about to be part of the same company. On Tuesday, the Wall Street Journal reported that Microsoft had agreed to buy Activision Blizzard in an all-cash deal valued at $75.5 billion. That's a lot of suitcases stuffed with money. Yup. 
The acquisition, which is the largest ever all cash purchase of a U.S. company, not to mention the most expensive acquisition in Microsoft's history and the biggest in video game history by roughly a factor of six, would bolster the Xbox maker's video game revenue by roughly half and would make Microsoft the world's third largest video game company after Sony and Tencent. Whether the deal will close as anticipated by July 2023, whether it will be good for gamers, or at least some subset of them, and whether it bodes well for the fed-up activist employees of Activision are all difficult to forecast. But as agreed to and approved by both boards and principal, the transaction touches on almost every hot-button issue in the industry, including consolidation among the major developers and publishers, efforts at workplace reform and unionization, doubling down on streaming and Netflix-style game libraries, the pursuit of sticky mobile games, and confusing speculation about the metaverse. Activision Blizzard is a behemoth that consists of several corporate components, most notably Activision Publishing, Blizzard Entertainment, and King. Together, these entities oversee an appreciable percentage of the video game franchises that even non-gamers have heard of or could quickly pick out of a digital lineup, including not just Call of Duty and Candy Crush Saga, but also World of Warcraft, Starcraft, Hearthstone, Overwatch, Diablo, Guitar Hero, Tony Hawk's, Crash Bandicoot, and many more. As console manufacturers and tech giants explore cloud gaming and focus on monthly subscription revenue, the console war has morphed into a subscription service war, and the richest spoils will go to the company with the deepest library and most enticing lineup of exclusives. By buying both Candy Crush and a suite of additional HD games that can be streamed to mobile devices via the Game Pass app, Microsoft is taking a two-pronged approach to penetrating the massive mobile market. Assuming this sale doesn't run into any antitrust trouble with regulatory bodies like the Justice Department, the FTC or the SEC, and the European Union, it will likely serve as a model for more acquisitions to come. So take two, we we talked about that uh, a few episodes ago, that it was the biggest gaming deal Mm -hmm. uh, ever put down when they bought out Zynga. Yeah, and that record stood for a few days. (laughs) Right, and then Microsoft was like, hold my beer. (laughs) I'm going in and I'm going to like, you know, quintuple the amount. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's yeah. cute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 17 billion. Mm, that's nice. Hey, interesting. Hey, hey, Spyro and Crash, I want you to come eat uh, Master Chief for me, would you? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, this, this, is, this is a lot. Because now what does that mean for titles like Crash Bandicoot, which was primarily a PlayStation exclusive? So it kind of, to me, felt like that's going to be sort of the bellwether for how how they're going to handle all this. Like if they decide to pull them out of PlayStation and have Crash on Xbox, it's like you guys are going to just be dicks about this whole thing, aren't you? <laughs> right. Well, and that's kind of how it was back in the console wars of the 90s where they had uh, system exclusive uh, titles, you know, leading up into the mm-hmm. 2000s where you could only get this one game if you bought the Sega Genesis or if you bought the Super Nintendo or if you bought the PlayStation 1. Even to the point in which companies would actually kind of strong arm publishers yeah. and developers. Uh, for example, uh, with Capcom, Nintendo kind of strong armed them in regards to Mega Man. Hmm. Uh, and that's why you only saw Mega Man released in, in Europe and Japan under Wily Wars and why you didn't see that uh, as a Sega option for North America. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. The, there's a, a strong history uh, behind uh, shady deals in the background <laughs> to, to make sure that people buy your console because it's got the games you want. Mm-hmm. I think if there's some comfort to be had, though, as far as console exclusivity, Xbox doesn't seem they don't seem to be hard asses about it. Mm-hmm. Aside from, you know, key titles, maybe like Forza, maybe uh, Halo. But for the most part, they seem pretty willing to accept money from any gamer, regardless of which console they choose to play on. They mm. have at least verbally kind of uh, when they bought Bethesda kind of calmed everybody down and says, relax, you know, it's not our intention to keep Bethesda games only on Xbox. Having said that, though, mm. the more studios, the more companies that they get under their banner, it could be kind of like a slow creep of mm-hmm. exclusivity slowly, slowly catching on until eventually they've scooped enough people under their game pass to where it, everything's exclusive and it doesn't matter anymore. But I mean, it would behoove them to have an exclusive game on for their console in order to get people to buy it. But also they're making money off of, <laughs> of this when people buy it from Sony. So in it, 
actually, I think probably makes more sense to just get the licensing money off of that too. So you were, t- we're talking like you release it on Microsoft, give it a year and a half or something like that, and then release it out to everything. And I think they've done that with a lot yeah. of their titles. So, I mean, it, it, this is a crazy good business move on them. Hmm. And if you, you want to talk about their ability to uh, dictate how the market goes, and also they're pushing their own desire for things like crossplay, this helps that uh, by having more access to games uh, and making sure that you're the ones who are in charge about the the development and, and what it looks like moving forward. So mm-hmm. it's uh, it's turning into an oligopoly, though. That's the problem. You raise a good point about crossplay um, because now, yeah. I mean, that seems to be whereas before it was either buy our console and the, all the titles they're in. But now it's like we mm-hmm. want everybody to be able to play together no matter what system you have. And I like that. Whenever I play multiplayer games, it's I can play against somebody who's on an Xbox or a PlayStation while I'm on my PC or what have you. So I, I think this is definitely a good idea if they continue with this method and not just have these particular libraries isolated or siloed on one specific console just because Microsoft bought them. Hmm. Right. They've been pretty good stewards with Minecraft, uh, yep. which you know they could have maybe tried to drive to a PC or Xbox only thing, but it's widely available like Minecraft on anything and everything. Uh, and they've kind of been hands off with it. So readily available, perhaps that continues to be the trend. And like with the moneymaker that Call of Duty was, if I'm not misquoting, I think Call of Duty represented two of the highest grossing titles on PlayStation in 2021. Mm-hmm. So the thought that X, you know, Microsoft would pull by the company and say, I don't want that money <laughs> because it's blue instead of green <laughs> and they move away. So can we rely on them to be continue to be good stewards and support all of us gamers? Um, I don't know. <laughs> They're a pain in the ass when it comes to Windows computers. Oh, True. yeah. <laughs> and all the services that you have to have for Windows. Everything yep. is a subscription. Hmm. It's, it's really difficult if you want to use anything else besides their, their suite of things. Constantly having to sign up, have an account for everything. I hate them. I hate them so much <laughs> when it comes to computers. Probably part of the reason why I don't really play Xbox is because of my general distaste for Microsoft as a whole. <laughs> so while, you know, on the one hand, we'd like to hope that they're going to be good stewards. But on the other hand, eh, I don't have a, a great deal of hope for that. Do you guys have any excitement around this potentially putting some life into some titles that have kind of beleaguered lately. Uh, like for instance, um, Starcraft. Yes. You know, did- <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to be something that Ryan was excited about. <laughs> so do you feel, so you feel like this might inject some new life into an old one like Starcraft? I don't presume that it will happen, but man, would that make me like a kid in a candy store, right? Uh, to see that they were coming out with something new, utilizing the StarCraft IP. Whether it's another strategy game, which would be great, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I don't think that there's a lot of, we'll say, clamoring in the, the modern marketplace for a game like StarCraft. But uh, if you could create something utilizing all of the, the different characters like Kerrigan and Jim Rayner and all that stuff, I think that would be fantastic. I would absolutely love that. And I think that actually brings up a point worth discussing blizzard never saw fit to bring back starcraft unless it was something that they were working on and just never told anybody they have Mm -hmm. did warcraft 3 reforge which was was a disaster uh they did diablo 2 which i haven't really heard anything about so it must have been fine (laughs) it's it's actually yeah the diablo 2 remaster is pretty damn good that was great I, i enjoyed it okay so but i mean the question is how much of modern blizzard is Microsoft going to keep? How much are they going to right. get, get rid of? I mean, there's been lots of talk about Bobby Kotick, whether he's staying or whether he's going. Uh, nobody has confirmed, but the rumors state that once the acquisition is complete, he'll be leaving with an extremely nice payout. So the bad mm. guy does win in the end. Hooray. <laughs> But I guess I wonder how much of the culture of Activision Blizzard can we realistically expect to change? And that's a great question. I think a lot of people have been wondering what how that's going to shake out. Uh, and they've been very vocal on Twitter. I mean, everybody's talking about the fact that, let's be honest, Activision Blizzard's entire culture right now is extremely toxic. 
you know, one of the things that you you saw was Microsoft, of course, was condemning Activision Blizzard months and months ago for this. <laughs> and now they bought the company. And so it'll be interesting to see what the cultural changes will be uh, from, you know, this transition. Uh, I know that personally, having worked in many companies that merge or get bought out, uh, that it does. It changes overnight. You you change out staff. You decide whether or not somebody is going to be a good fit culturally for this new combined organization. So uh, there will definitely uh, already be a shakeup. But man, you got to address some of the the people that are experiencing this day to day toxic culture and uh, potentially. I mean, I, I don't know personally <laughs> what Microsoft's culture is, but the fact that we're not talking about it. <laughs> it's probably a good sign that things are, are okay, right? They're probably uh, smart enough that they they got their ducks together a little while ago. Right, right. So um, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this is an opportunity for them to inject some of that culture. So you're telling me you're not going to change the culture, but we get StarCraft 2? <laughs> well, that was kind of my thing. You, <laughs> you want a new StarCraft, but you really want Modern Blizzard to make it. I wouldn't. I hate Modern Blizzard. I just want the game. <laughs> Have you seen their end user license agreements? They're insane. Nobody reads those things. Come on. I do. <laughs> the one person in the world that reads those things. <laughs> yeah, I think so with Microsoft, it's Satya Nadella for the, as a CEO role. Uh, you know, I, I don't work with Eric. I can't speak from firsthand experience of it. Mm -hmm. Through reports that I have heard, it does seem to be a company that's trying to bring in uh, diversity, respect, like, some degree of, and, and sorry, Blue, I'm not trying to defend Microsoft or make you a <laughs> lover of Microsoft. But <laughs> Don't worry, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> not an issue. <laughs> but the uh, from all appearances, it seems that th it's something they're taking seriously, at least with uh, some of the wrecking that has come within tech companies recently. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, at very, you can't do worse than what was happening at Activision Blizzard. And I hate to set such a low bar, right. but, you know, you do read some of the stuff that Satya is trying to do in the Microsoft. And you kind of hope that it seems almost like a refreshing injection into that company. That company seemed to be so toxic, and so awful, old boys club just baked into its DNA. So to kind of just rip it out of where it was and inject it into a kind of somewhat modern tech company could, you know, I don't call it save them, but like really hopefully turn that place around for the workers. And sure. I hope that's something that the a benefit that the workers there do see. And hopefully that results in better games. I also do take a bit of grim satisfaction in the idea that uh, guys on Sony will have to buy Call of Duty and inadvertently uh, give Microsoft money for <laughs> buying something <laughs> on their PlayStation. <laughs> like, you know, the, there are many fanboys out there, and I think that would make them very sour. Right? It's so good to have a little, like, trolling Xbox logo on the bottom of all You're those right? games. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, welcome to Call of Duty PlayStation. <laughs> Xbox T. <tea. laughs> I, I hope it has that sound effect. T. T. <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and jump into Professor Rybred's Gaming History 101. Professor Rybred, are you ready? Uh, this guy sucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for coming, students. Please take your seats. Welcome back to Professor Rybred's Gaming History 101. In today's lesson, we will discuss on why on every single game that you own, and that you purchase, rather, nowadays in the U.S., comes this little tiny black box in the corner of your box art uh, that includes a letter and tells you who the game is intended for and why. So, of course, we're going to be talking about the creation of the ESRB, better known as the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. How do you guys feel about the ESRB? <laughs> do you have any opinions? I don't think my 12-year-old self ever noticed. And, right, uh, right. <laughs> I'm not sure my kids are ever going to notice it either. Probably a good idea. <laughs> Terrible execution. <laughs> I, I don't think the the amount of games back when we were kids really warranted an ESRB rating, except mm -hmm. for like some of the off ones like um, that they had on the 3DO that were more adult oriented. And what we'll be talking about today is one of your favorite games mm -hmm. as well. Do tell. Called Night Trap. <laughs> Yay! 
which was at the height of controversy uh, back in the early 90s. So the question, though, is why cover this topic? So for one, the ESRB was established to help prevent government oversight uh, into the gaming industry. They didn't want the U.S. government to be able to dictate what they do. Uh, it talks about the idea of censorship. I'm not a huge fan of censorship. So uh, this even... It doesn't directly create censorship, uh, but as we'll talk about later on, is that it uh, it certainly makes console or rather uh, game developers uh, a little bit hesitant as to what they're putting into games. Mm -hmm. Uh, And lastly, it actually may have helped fuel the idea that Nintendo was the kiddie console and Sega was the adult one. So interesting stuff. But let's start at the beginning. So on December 7th uh, began a congressional hearing of government affairs and the judiciary. Uh, with several spokespeople from companies in regards to violence and adult content in video games that they perceived were having an impact on children. Kind of a bold statement. I mean, if we look at it nowadays, we kind of all collectively understand, at least if you are a gamer, you're familiar with the idea that there are multitude of scientific studies out there that tell you violence in video games does not cause children to become violent adults. But in 1993, there weren't that many studies to go off of. So one of Joe Lieberman's chief of staff, who was named Bill Anderson, apparently he was asked by his son to pick up Mortal Kombat for the second Genesis, brought the game home and then saw the crazy violence that was available to him. (laughs) He must've found the blood code. (laughs) Right, right. The son definitely found the blood code. And I'm assuming had a whole list of fatalities that he did in front of his dad. <laughs> but the interesting part was that he went to his boss, Joe Lieberman, who of course was the senator and said, look at this. Like, I, I want you to see how graphically violent this is. And Joe was like, whoa, that's that's nuts. Uh, eventually also became aware of Night Trap as well for the Sega Genesis or Sega CD rather. And recognized that, quote unquote, the content was problematic. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Donnie, can you give me like a like a 20 second synopsis of what Night Trap is? Sure. Night Trap is a uh, like almost like a first person view where you're looking over the house of these vampires and your job is to save the girls that are spending the weekend there from these vampires and these beings called augers. You activate traps to catch the augers and ultimately the vampires themselves. And these uh, vampires are involved in very graphic death scenes if you don't do things right. <laughs> so. uh, that's not true, actually. Um, they're not involved in any graphic death scenes whatsoever. They just get caught by the traps. Now, however, the thing that set off this controversy was the scantily clad females in Ladies. the video game. The ladies. <laughs> um, did they ever watch horror movies in the 80s? Right. There's one scene where there's uh, a female in the bathroom in a nightgown or a negligee, and that's pretty much it. Clutching my pearls right now. <gasps> How dare they? <laughs> right. You got you got other other members of the cast that are in you know tube tops or halter tops and right. short shorts and whatnot, and and I guarantee you the thought was the senators. Oh, we can't have that. All while leaving their favorite hooker establishment. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> that really puts it into context. It really does. <laughs> All right. So, taking a look at it, the, the hearing that they had, they brought in a whole bunch of representatives from uh, several different companies, and that actually led to some tension in the courtroom uh, because at the time, Sega and Nintendo were big competitors of each other, and they had a pretty big rivalry, especially in the US. Nintendo was allowed to speak first, and uh, Howard Lincoln, who was the president of Nintendo of America, kind of led off his part of the testimony by acknowledging that Nintendo's had taken action to remove some of the violence from Mortal Kombat. If you remember, it's sweat, not blood, right? But he's painting this picture, like Nintendo is the one who's already kind of censoring themselves, you know, like we're, we're, we're the good guys in regards to this. So one of the second key point was the transformation of video game industry from primarily having a younger audience to, to more of an adult one. And that Night Trap was only meant for adults. Lincoln came back on that one and told him, uh, I can't just sit here and allow you to be told that the video game industry has transformed from children to adults. And so this is kind of where we talked about before this idea Nintendo's the kitty console, Sega's the adult console. This has helped really fuel some of that sentiment uh, for, for many people. 
it's not it wasn't the catalyst that started that that train of thought but it certainly did not help Sega kind of came back on that, uh, saying that it was developing its own uh, system as far as rating was concerned, uh, and that it would label its games that were being criticized by consumers. And in fact, what Sega's representative did is they took out a videotape of violent games that were on the Super Nintendo (laughs) and stressed (laughs) the importance (laughs) of a rating system, uh, which at this point, Nintendo lacked. So this was a, a little interesting, like tit for tat, if you will, between these two. So eventually what ended up happening is that they had two hearings, a similar kind of back and forth in regards to just several senators asking questions and them trying to kind of respond to it as far as violence and and, and adult content in regards to video games. Uh, But eventually what they would do is they would sponsor a bill called the Voting or Video Games Rating Act of 1994. Bill didn't actually pass because what ended up happening was uh, there was a provision there that said that they wouldn't vote on the bill if the gaming industry created their own rating system. So naturally the ESRB was born. It started off with the SVP of EA, which was Jack Heinstein. He actually reached out to Sega and Nintendo and said, Hey, let's work together to develop a rating system. Let's, you know, like let's not fight each other. Uh, Sega kind of suggested their own system. Like, Hey, we've already got one. <laughs> and of course, Nintendo refused to accept something that was created by a competitor. Right. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't give me that Sonic trash. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so once the ESRB was created, uh, they modeled their system after the motion pictures association of America, uh, defining kind of five age categories, if you will. So, also setting up a set of descriptive terms that would appear next to the rating to help to describe the specific content that could be found uh, within that game. So the ratings are as follows. E for everyone. One that was added recently is E10+, plus, which for everyone older than 10, so not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Definitely uh, not me. T for teen, M for mature, and AO for adults only. Have you guys ever seen an AO game? I have not. No. Hmm, no. And the reason behind that is that uh, it's only been given to 29 games. Oh, is Snow Job one of them? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> A vast majority of those games are PC uh, adult content. That is what checks call out. Them. Yep. That math checks out. Not Nintendo Switch? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> and people, I said Snow Job. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Uh, for example, there was a screensaver for Playboy, uh, which was one of the adult-only games. How um, is a screensaver a game? That's a good point, uh, but it's listed <laughs> on there as uh, one of the illustrious 29 uh, that are adult-only. Most of the games, though, that are on there no longer are on there. So similar to how what, what studios will do is when they get like an NC-17 rating on a movie, they'll remove some of the content that's graphic to... Uh, reduce that to an R. A lot of those, uh, for example, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, come to find out you can hack the game to a point in which it allows you to see two characters engaging in, in adult things. And <laughs> so, well, like balancing your checkbook? That, that's exactly <laughs> it. And doing your taxes. <laughs> it's really, really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Kids can't see this. <laughs> taxes. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they took some of that stuff out and patched the game and then it went back down to a a mature rating. So kind of an interesting story behind it to this idea that we needed to regulate ourselves. 93, there was this hotly contested court case around it. And to me, it's not something I like, I don't like censorship. I, I kind of talked about that before. So sometimes I think that what you end up doing is censoring out things that you wanted to put in a game in order to get the rating that you want. Not a huge fan of that. But he wants the taxes. Uh, he wants the taxes, exactly. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, it's it's not something that creates a, a problem for me as an adult gamer. So I can't really complain too much about it, right? I can go into any store and buy any game I want. So it's not a big deal. Kind of is what it is. I'm sure there are parents out there that appreciate the ability to rather than having to research a game and go on Wikipedia and be like, is this game bad for my kids? (laughs) Right. It's got the rating. (laughs) Right. An army of 12 year olds are like, nope, it's fine. You should totally buy it for your son and daughter. (laughs) (laughs) Also get this extra pack. It's great. (laughs) The tax pack. 
the right the text <laughs> <laughs> there's a documentary on youtube um regarding digital pictures who created night trap i believe i haven't watched it in quite some time but i think there was a piece in there where digital pictures actually approached nintendo mm. about um, wow. Night Trap being on their console and actually them developing it. But Nintendo said, eh, why don't you go towards Sega? Like this was a very amicable, like, eh, go go towards Sega. I think they're they're better <laughs> off to help you. And then Nintendo just lit them up in those uh, Senate hearings. <laughs> and the, the crazy part is Howard Lincoln was quoted as saying, Night Trap will never be on Nintendo. <laughs> and in 2018... <laughs> Nice. <laughs> the Nintendo Switch got a release of Night Trap. So, Howard Lincoln, you were wrong, sir. <laughs> I am looking at my collector's edition of yep. Night Trap on the Nintendo Switch right now on my shelf, and I am tasting your tears, Howard Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so kind of wrap things up here, summation. Uh, the 90s were nuts. If only they could see games now. <laughs> uh, Mortal Kombat and Night Trap would have never <laughs> sparked as much controversy. <laughs> As it did. Uh, but thank you again for attending today's lesson. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have ideas for stories you'd like to hear, uh, feel free to send us an email at gamersweekpodcast at gmail.com, and we might feature your suggestion. All right. So that brings us to the end of today's conversation, podcast, whatever it is that you want to call it. So thank you for listening to episode five of the Gamers Week podcast. And a big thank you to Retro Game Club Podcast for sponsoring this episode. You guys are awesome. Also, Trevor, thank you for uh, coming on and filling in for today. Uh, so if you guys are out there listening, do not forget to check out NewDadGaming.com. So again, thank you so much, Trevor. It was awesome to have you. An absolute pleasure. I'll be real curious to see what uh, rating you put on this show after everything we've said. <laughs> NC-17. NC-17. So there's going to be two probably. versions. One's going to be AO. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Two cuts. Collector's cut. Yeah. Can't thank you guys enough. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Trevor. Always fun talking with you. So if you want to connect with Gamers Week, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Email us at Gamers Week Podcast at gmail.com. Check us out on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Gamers Week Podcast. We will be streaming sometime soon. So follow us first so that you will get an alert. You can also visit our merch store, which has the longest <laughs> URL <laughs> ever. Say it. Say it. Gamers-week-podcast.creator-spring.com. Yay. <laughs> so if you want it the easy way, though, follow the link in the show notes. And uh, feel free to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash gamersweek. And finally, since you made it all the way to the end of the episode, leave us a rating and a review to let us know how we did. We really value your feedback. And while you're there, consider subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. I feel like there was a tone with that, uh, that streaming thing. <laughs> you know, I, there was a judgmental tone there. Get on top of it. <laughs> Read it T for teen. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Gamble responsibly. Yeah. Good night, guys. Good night. <laughs>